Mazda has always been a bit unconventional in its approach to automotive design, except, historically at least, when it comes to arguably its most conventional model, the Mazda 3 family hatchback. But all that changes right here, right now, with this fourth generation version. You can see at a glance that the styling's different from the norm, and, as we'll discover in this film, much else is too. It actually had to be. Selling a conventional family hatch when the trend is to buy a more fashionable SUV is hard enough. And if you're a volume brand trying to break the stranglehold that established players like Volkswagen's Golf and Ford's Focus have in the family hatchback sector, then your job's even harder. All of which partly explains the relative lack of headway that the Japanese make has made with the Mazda 3 model line since it's first arrived back in 2003. Back then, Mazda was a Ford-owned brand and its products were broadly chained to the blue oval maker's technology. It is pretty hard to produce something better than a Ford Focus when your car has to be based on a Ford Focus. Today though, the Mazda 3 no longer has to be. The second generation model of 2009 was still very much Ford based, but by the time the third generation design was introduced in 2013, the brand was starting to go its own way prior to a complete split from Ford in 2015. This Mark IV model shows us just what Mazda's capable of on its own. Quite a lot, as it turns out. It's intended to appeal to what the company calls free spirits, the kind of person who wants something stylish and interesting in this class, but doesn't want quality or engineering compromises. Or, to put it another way, think of a car of this type as good to drive as a Ford Focus, as good inside as a Volkswagen Golf, and as good to look at as an Alfa Romeo Giulietta. That's what Mazda was aiming at. As for what we've got here, well, there's quite a lot. Uh, the fact that the new two litre Skyactiv-G petrol engine we're gonna try here ignores turbocharging is another break with current convention. Although Mazda has followed the current trend towards part electrified mild hybrid technology for it. And they've created a more powerful supercharged Skyactiv-X version of that unit, uh, which uses spark controlled compression ignition to deliver petrol response allied to diesel economy. A fresh 1.8 litre Skyactiv D diesel is the alternative. All of this engineering is bolted to a brand new, much stiffer platform, and the trend with previous Mazdas for slinky styling to clothe a rather dull cabin design has been broken here with what might just be the nicest interior in the segment. Add in standard equipment features that you'd have to pay extra for on rivals and plenty of camera-driven safety kit and you have a promising sounding package offered either in this hatch form or as a smartly styled saloon. So, time to put it to the test. With the rise and rise of the SUV, there are these days fewer and fewer reasons to buy a family hatchback. One of them though is dynamic driving enjoyment. We've yet to find an affordable crossover really geared towards that in a way that uh, a really well-engineered family hatchback can be. And if this class of car is gonna survive in its current form, it's gonna have to better maximize that attribute. Historically, Ford's Focus has been the car that best epitomized ride and handling purity in this segment. So much so that a decade ago, Volkswagen headhunted the Blue Oval brand engineers behind it to try to lift their Golf model to the same level. Mazda, though, didn't need to do that. In developing this Mark IV Mazda 3, they already knew exactly what made a Focus great, this model line having been based on that one in its first three generations of life. Perhaps it's not surprising then uh, to learn that the Hiroshima engineers also knew exactly how to improve it, which is what they claim to have done with this model. You get a feel for what's been achieved here pretty much immediately you drive the thing. Does any family car have a better manual gear shift than this one? Well, not in our experience. Uh, Honda Civic gets closest. Otherwise, changing gear in a typical family hatchback tends to feel like operating some sort of domestic appliance. Mazda's whole Jimba Itai approach to design champions something different. And because you can swap through the six ratios properly with wrist flick changes, there's nothing to get in the way of what the Japanese call toitsukan, a word that describes the feeling that you get of 
greater control. Control that's more predictable, uh, more assured and more usable. Keen drivers will know what we're talking about when we say that some family hatchbacks seem to want to fight your inputs and are a bit of a battle to drive, whereas others just work in harmony with you. Uh, this Mazda 3 is one of the latter. We'd worried that this fourth generation model switch away from independent rear suspension to a theoretically cruder torsion beam arrangement might have damaged ride quality, but the engineers have put in a lot of work into this revamped damping setup to make it work with this fourth generation model's much stiffer body shell and platform and its longer wheelbase and wider track. In addition, you get G-Vectoring Control Plus, essentially a more sophisticated take on the kind of torque vectoring system that many rival models use to reduce wheel spin when you're powering through corners at speed. Uh, usually that kind of setup is based only on throttle positioning. It uh, momentarily reduces the amount of torque that's delivered to the front wheels as you enter a bend. That transfers weight to the front axle, which increases front tyre grip, thus enabling the front wheels to turn more precisely. Uh, GVC Plus does this too, but it works in a more accurate, driver-orientated way because it also takes steering inputs into account. Uh, the combined result of this clever approach is an MX-5 style keenness to change direction, uh, a reduction in your head and body sway, and a sense of real fluency to the way that this car goes down the road. The resulting package works really well on British roads and should you feel the urge, you can cover ground at a real pace without the car feeling ragged or tiring to drive. Uh, the front end is incredibly good and you'd have to be doing something extremely advised to bring the stability or traction control into play on dry tarmac. You'll also like the direct steering which chirps its feedback, uh, the perfect pedal placement and the powerful positive feel of the all disc braking system. It's all good or nearly all good anyway. If you select the engine we're trying here, the base Skyactiv G petrol unit that most Mazda 3 buyers are expected to choose, uh, the performance feels extremely modest, uh, which is surprising when you consider that it's two liters in size. Now, this isn't really down to the 122 PS output. That's about par for the course with the base petrol power plant and a car of this kind. It's more about the fact that Mazda refuses to fit turbochargers to its petrol engines. So rather counterintuitive Intuitively, you get less mid-range pulling power than a Ford or Volkswagen engine of half the capacity. That's despite Mazda's decision to give this engine mild hybrid assistance. Uh, the M Hybrid 24 volt electrified system ought to compensate slightly for the normally aspirated unit's lack of torque, harvesting energy when decelerating to reduce the strain on the engine under acceleration. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't seem to help very much. What all this translates into on the road is that the little urge forward that you'd normally get at around 1500 RPM in a car of this sort is missing, and you have to drop down a gear and rev the thing hard instead. Fortunately, because of the lovely manual stick shift, that's no great hardship. Uh, think carefully before you opt for the alternative six-speed automatic. Even Mazda, though, can't avoid the need for a turbo in a diesel engine, although in previous years it did used to try. Uh, given the current zeitgeist and for other reasons that we'll get onto in a minute, uh, we're actually rather surprised that the brand's bothering to offer a black pump fueled option for this car this time around. A 116 PS 1.8 litre Skyactiv D unit has been developed for the CX3 small SUV, so presumably the engineers thought they might as well use it. Uh, this power plant certainly gives you back the mid-range urge that's missing from this Skyactiv G version, but the benchmark performance figures aren't a lot different. Uh, now, whereas the base petrol engine gets you to 62 miles an hour in 10.4 seconds on the way to 122 miles an hour, uh, for the Skyactiv D, the figures are 10.3 and 121 mph. To be frank, both of those power plants are a bit of a weak link in the Mazda 3 armory. But don't despair if you love everything else about this car because the third of the three engine options, the Skyactiv X, makes up for everything. It's a development of the Skyactiv G 2 litre petrol unit, but it's very different, developing 181 PS and using what the brand calls Spark Controlled Compressed Ignition or SPCCI. It's a patented lean burn probe 
process that delivers exceptional efficiency. Um, interestingly, it incorporates a supercharger, not for extra performance, although torque is increased by up to 30% over the Skyactiv G unit, but instead to ensure that there's enough air in the engine for the compression ignition to work properly. The premium to get a Mazda 3 with a Skyactiv X engine isn't a lot different to the extra you'd pay to get the feebler, less efficient Skyactiv D diesel unit, which does beg the question of why you'd ever want to choose the black pump fueled version of this car. Uh, we think very few customers will. Another reason for choosing the Skyactiv X power plant is that it's the only engine offered in this car that can be mated with the brand's iActiv all wheel drive system. Uh, that's an option with this hatch body style. Whatever your final engine choice in this car, Mazda hopes that you'll notice the effort it's made to improve highway cruising refinement, helped by the more rigid body, bespoke carpeting, uh, a specially tuned floor, a sophisticated natural sound smoother technology, and what the brand calls natural sound frequency control, which reduces combustion noise. The end result is brilliantly suppressed wind and road noise, and the kind of hush that you get in a premium badged hatch of this sort. Uh, providing you're not having to rev out the Skyactiv-G engine, which over 4,500 RPM can get a bit raucous. In some ways though, occasionally having to do that is part of this car's appeal, which for us is considerable. Uh, one in every three Mazdas sold anywhere in the world is a three, and don't expect that to change anytime soon. I want something that nobody else has done before. That was the goal that Ikuo Maeda, Mazda's global head of design, set his team with this fourth generation Mazda 3. It's the kind of brief that every stylist must dread. Nor, unlike some of its competitors, could this car be styled slightly differently to suit the preferences of various world markets. Aesthetically, it would have to be something special that would suit almost everybody. And that's an objective we would have told you was a contradiction in terms until we saw this car. It borrows its sensual shaping from the evolved version of the brand's Kodo design language that was first showcased on the company's recent RX Vision and Vision Coupe Motor Show concept cars. And at a stroke, it makes almost everything else in the segment look either uninspired, stodgy or overstyled, thanks to clean surfacing and coupe-like lines that are almost startlingly effective in the way that light and shade plays on the sculpted panels. Examine them closely and you'll realize that unlike almost every other car on the road, there are no crease lines. For aesthetic expression, the panels rely almost entirely on the way that they reflect the surrounding environment. Almost all sales in our market will be of this seductively shaped hatchback version rather than the slightly more conventional looking alternative saloon. And both variants share this low to the ground style of nose design. The slim LED headlamps with their ring shaped lighting pattern flowing into this imposing black grille. The profile perspective, though, is perhaps the part of the car that looks most sophisticated. The powerful C-pillars, the distinctive side panel surfacing, the minimal gaps between tyres and wheel arches, all of it differentiates the look of this car from its rivals. And of course, to suit the mood of the moment, there are big wheels, either 16 or, as in this case, 18 inches in size, depending on your preference. Mazda has tried to be equally creative at the rear, primarily with rear combination lamps that sit behind three-dimensional outer lenses and feature four round lights with graduations in their illumination intended to create the appearance of forward motion. Uh, this subtle roof spoiler provides a finishing touch. As usual, what's more important is what you can't see. Uh, the body bolted to the all-new platform has 27% more ultra-high tensile steel than was used in the previous model. It's a new generation Skyactiv vehicle architecture package based on straight framework and continuous ring structures that's far stiffer and more crash resistant than before. Right, time to take a look at the cabin. Now Mazda reckons that the styling of this car doesn't sell it to you. There's more than a chance that the look and feel that you get when seated up front will. So let's see. 
Well, it's certainly different. The modern design of this kind of car tends now to be typified by an almost overload of elements. Huge screens, bright infotainment graphics, and lots and lots of information. Mazda, though, has gone a different way here, pursuing a minimalist theme that has seen almost every unnecessary ancillary control removed. Only the essentials are left, all of which have a satisfying look and feel, and are designed within an elegantly slender dashboard, swathed in lovely, soft touch surfaces. Plus, it's not just that it looks good. We're struggling to think of an ergonomically superior cabin in a car of this kind. And that hasn't been achieved by accident. The designers went to huge efforts working on the placement of controls so that they could be used by the arm at a more relaxed angle, which is one of the reasons why the manual gear stick is so satisfying to use. Little touches also help here, like the way that the armrest is almost twice as long as it was in the previous model to make it easier for the driver to operate the rotary command control for the infotainment display. Ah oh yes, infotainment. Well, that's another area in which Mazda has bucked the current fashion. The larger, clearer 8.8-inch center dash monitor that's been fitted this time around ignores the trend for touchscreen functionality, which the Japanese brand says is distracting for the driver. We agree with that. Once you adjust to the functionality of the command control, it's much easier to select the audio, phone, informational, or navigational features that you want without taking your eyes off the road. And because it doesn't have to be positioned uh, near enough to be touched, the display can be closer to the screen and so more in your line of sight. Uh, talking of interfaces in your line of sight, this head-up active driving display is standard across the range and the uh, instruments that you view through the uh, gorgeously crafted steering wheel are a model of clarity. The dials are separated by a 7-inch TFT display and because the dials are now of the LED variety, the speedo can be configured to display in different ways, as a conventional dial, as a dial with incorporated trip info, or as a display with digital speed readouts and safety assistance graphics. As usual, Mazda's Jimba Itai human-centric approach to cabin design makes it pretty easy to find a near-perfect driving position. There's 70 millimeters of telescopic steering adjustment, that's 10 mils more than before, and front seat cushion tilt adjustment is standard on all models, as is driver's seat lumbar support as part of the drive to better support the driver's pelvic and back regions. Not quite so good is all-round visibility. Uh, despite changes to the thickness and the shape of the A-pillar, front three-quarter vision is only adequate, and your over-the-shoulder view is, well, quite frankly, awful by class standards, thanks to that tiny rear window and the vast C-pillar, which Mazda appears to acknowledge by uh, fitting a blind spot monitoring system as standard right across the range. Cabin storage space isn't much to write home about either. Uh, most of the space in the Flockline glove box is taken up by the owner's manual, which is a bit pointless since that can uh, display in digital form on the central infotainment screen. Uh, you do, though, get decently sized door bins with bottle holders. And there's also this uh, rubber-coated non-slip area in front of the gear lever, which is probably where you'll want to put your phone because there's a USB point just above. Uh, next to that, rather refreshing, there's a CD player provided too. Uh, behind that is a lidded area covering a couple of cup holders. The top is finished in piano black trimming which um, also surrounds the gear stick and that's surfacing that looks really smart but which will easily smear and scratch. Uh, there's also an overhead compartment for your sunglasses. Uh, there is a compartment down by the driver's right knee and there's also a ticket clip here on the driver's sun visor. Plus, you get a deep compartmentalized bin between the seats, complete with USB and 12 volt ports, and the sliding top we mentioned earlier. Overall, when it comes to interior storage, other family hatches might improve a little on what's offered here, but most really do feel a bit cheap compared to a Mazda 3, particularly a reasonably well-specified variant like this one is. Uh, never mind golf standards of quality, this car's interior has more of the kind of feel that you'd get from a premium branded hatch like a BMW 1 Series or a Mercedes A-Class. Uh, the dash trimming material has the look and feel of real leather, and if you want the real thing, uh, then you can trim the seats in this hatch version in either black or burgundy. 
We also like the little touches, the way, for instance, that the wipers constantly alter their operating angle in fine adjustments to ensure that they clean right to the edges of the windscreen, and the way that the eight-speaker standard audio setup has been redesigned from the ground up and omits lower door-mounted speakers to try to reduce the tinny buzzing at low frequencies that audio systems in family cars typically suffer from. Um, here, we're trying the upgraded 12-speaker Bose package which offers clearer sound quality than some audio systems we've tried in vastly more expensive cars. Now where this model's customer proposition starts to unravel a little is when it comes to rear seat space. Now at 4.46 metres long, it's not especially big by the standards of the family hatchback class, but the main issue to start with lies with the constrictions brought about by this sweeping C pillar and by the swept back roof line. If you habitually have to get things like child seats in and out, you're not going to like it at all. Once inside, there are positive points. Leg and knee room is better than you might expect, and the cabin's wide enough for three adults to sit alongside each other without feeling like sardines. But the tiny rear side windows create a somewhat claustrophobic atmosphere, particularly when they're fitted with the privacy glass that we have here. And because of that low roof line that we mentioned earlier, anyone approaching six foot is likely to find their hair almost touching the ceiling. If you're not using the middle part of this bench, which is likely given the prominent height of this centre transmission tunnel, then you'll be able to pull down this central armrest with its twin cup holders. Uh, there are reasonably sized door pockets with bottle holders, but there are no vents. You don't get any sort of connectivity port and a seat back pocket is only provided on the left hand side, which does seem a bit mean. Um, on the plus side though, these LED overhead reading lights are smart and the quality ambiance is embellished by smart little touches like this door card stitching. Okay, let's finish with a look at the boot. Uh, this hatch version's 351 litres of storage capacity isn't anything to write home about. Uh, you get 450 litres in the saloon model. And the space on offer isn't especially wide. There's only uh, 1,014 mils between the rather intrusive wheel housings. Mazda's also forgotten to include bag hooks or tie down points. You only get these fairly useless straps on the right hand side wall. And there's a high lip to lift loads over, which will be a hindrance if if you're lumping in heavy items. Uh, there's not much room beneath the floor either, just seven litres of extra space. Certainly not enough to fit any sort of uh, standard spare wheel. The seat shoulder catches for the 60-40 split rear bench are a little awkward to reach, but at least when the cushion falls, it creates a pretty flat loading area that's 1,366 mils long and 1,026 litres in capacity. Uh, for the saloon, the figure is 1,138 litres. The Mazda 3 range isn't too difficult to get your head around. Prices sit mainly in the 20 to 30,000 pound bracket, which is common to better quality models in the volume branded part of the family hatchback segment. And there are just two body styles. We've got this five door hatch or an alternative four door saloon. Uh, we do wonder though, whether it's absolutely necessary to have five different trim levels, SEL, SEL Lux, Sport Lux, this GT Sport and uh, the top GT Sport tech spec. At uh, least your engine choice ought to be fairly straightforward. Now you might be surprised to hear that the base 122 PS Skyactiv-G petrol engine we're trying here gives as large as two litres in size. That's because it has to make up for the lack of a turbocharger. It is pretty sophisticated though. Uh, it incorporates uh, cylinder deactivation and a little electrified assistance from the brand's latest M hybrid system. There are two alternatives to this unit, the first being a 1.8 litre Skyactiv D diesel, replacing the 1.5 and 2.2 litre units used in the previous range. There's not much really wrong with this chirpy 116 PS engine, but we can't really see why you'd ever choose it when, for not much more, you can have this car with the engine that suits it best, Mazda's Skyactiv X petrol unit. Now, this engine uses a clever spark-controlled compression ignition process, which enables it to run much leaner than a normal petrol engine 
engine ever could. Hence, the brands claim that this 140 PS power plant is even more fuel efficient than the equivalent diesel. Opt for the hatch with the Skyactive X engine, and you'll also be able to specify Mazda's iActive AWD all wheel drive system. Whatever engine you do select, your dealer will offer you the choice between two six speed transmissions. Now, we'd very much recommend the slick shifting Skyactive MT manual that we're trying here, or for £1,300 more, you can have a Skyactive drive automatic. These days, you really have to want a conventional family hatchback like this to buy one over a small SUV, a car perhaps like the Mazda Model Lineup's crossover offering, the CX-3. Uh, that's a slightly smaller design than this Mazda 3 with less rear seat space and a smaller boot, but it'll only save you around £1,000 in Skyactiv-G petrol form. And as a Skyactiv-D diesel, a CX-3 will actually cost you around £1,000 more than an equivalently specified Mazda 3 with the same engine. Now, obviously, we could go on all day making comparisons with the various compact SUVs that sell for Mazda 3 money, but let's assume here that you want the kind of car that this is, a volume-branded family hatchback. Now, how does this stack up against the main segment players? Well, the first thing to bear in mind is that Mazda doesn't offer the kind of base poverty spec level that many rivals do provide. All Mazda 3 variants get premium standard features like navigation and LED headlights. So uh, to make a fair comparison with competitors, uh, with most of them, you really need to go a uh, step up from the base trim level, as we're going to do with the pricing observations that we're about to make. And they're based on comparisons against uh, this car's starting SEL spec with the volume Skyactiv-G petrol engine or the Skyactiv-D diesel. Let's start with the market leaders. For an equivalently powered ZTEC trimmed Ford Focus or SE spec Volkswagen Golf, you'd probably save around 500 pounds, but you get a lower level of spec with the SE. Uh, want to spread your net a little wider? Well, as you'd expect, some competitors will cost slightly less, others slightly more. An equivalent Vauxhall Astra in comparable tech line spec would save you around a thousand pounds. An equivalent Seat Leon in comparable SE technology form would save you around 1,500 pounds. And if you were to go for an equivalent Hyundai i30 in SE spec or Renault Megane in iconic guise, you'd save around 2,000 pounds. What else? Well, a Toyota Corolla 1.2 T petrol model costs about the same as a Mazda 3 Skyactiv G, as does a Citroen C4 Cactus in equivalent origin spec, or a Skoda Octavia in equivalent SE drive guys. Uh, if you were thinking of a Kia Seed, well, in comparable Seed 3 spec, you'd pay a fraction more than would be necessary to own this Mazda, and that's also the case for a Honda Civic in equivalent SR spec. Uh, for the Peugeot 308 in comparable Allure spec, you could be looking at up to £1,000 more before discounts come into play. What else? Um, well, a Mini Clubman might cost you fractionally less in petrol form, but it would cost you fractionally more as a diesel. As for big savings, well, you could save around £3,000 or so on, say, a Fiat Tipo in this class, but you get a much cheaper feeling product with higher running costs, inferior driving dynamics and less equipment. Now, we'd argue that for a really close comparison to what's on offer here, you need to look higher, not lower, in the family hatchback pecking order. Probably at something with a premium badge, in fact, like a BMW 1 Series, an Audi A3 or a Mercedes A-Class. Now, these are cars that sit in the 25 to 30,000 pound bracket. If having considered all this, you conclude it is a Mazda 3 that you really want, then you'll be expecting the kind of decent haul of standard equipment that cars in this class really now have to have. And sure enough, whichever hatch or saloon Mazda 3 variant you choose, all the main expected features are in evidence. Even with base SEL trim, you can expect to find 16-inch silver metallic alloy wheels, full LED headlights with auto leveling, uh, LED rear lamps, rear parking sensors, heated mirrors, auto headlamps and wipers, and a Thatcham Category 1 alarm. Interior features include elements that you'd normally have to pay extra for at the bottom of the range on a car of this kind. Uh, things like a head-up display, power folding functionality for the door mirrors, and for the driver's seat, lumbar support and cushion tilt adjustment. More expected inclusions run to air conditioning and leather for the steering wheel and for the gear knob, uh, along with a trip computer. 
As for driver stuff, well, there's a G Vectoring Control Plus system which helps to maximize traction through the corners and all models get the Mazda Radar Cruise Control Package which uses a millimeter radar and a forward-facing camera to automatically regulate your highway speed to vehicles ahead of you. Plus, if you come across a tailback and you've opted for an automatic Mazda 3 model, then this setup can automatically slow you down to a standstill and then start you off again. Um, Intelligent Speed Assist is built into that system and that's a setup that works with standard traffic sign recognition which allows the car to recognize the speed limit signs as you pass them. Because of this, once you've set a speed into the limiter, you won't be able to unintentionally exceed it which uh, really ought to prevent future speeding tickets, well in theory anyway. Infotainment across the Mazda 3 range is taken care of by a Mazda multimedia system using a Center Dash 8.8 inch color infotainment screen linked to voice activation and the kind of separate multimedia commander control dial that you'd normally need a premium brand model to get in this segment. Uh, this display incorporates an integrated navigation system. Uh, this one includes five years of free European map updates and a 3D gyro sensor which calculates the car's position even when there's no GPS signal. Uh, the setup will give you dynamic routing which diverts you around jams based on real-time traffic information uh, as well as information on speed camera locations, uh, weather forecasts and road conditions. Plus a search and go system which will direct you to places of interest at any given location, anywhere from a restaurant to a railway station. Uh, the monitor additionally delivers the usual Bluetooth and internet app integration elements, plus there's a high quality eight speaker DAB audio system. There's also a CD player, and that's an oft forgotten feature on modern cars these days. Plus you get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring too. Should you go further up the range? Well, beyond base SEL spec, the next step up is a lightly embellished SEL Lux trim level, which adds in smart keyless entry, uh, dual zone climate control, a reversing camera, and front parking sensors, plus an auto dimming feature for the rear view mirror and for the door mirrors. Uh, Mid-range sport Lux trim adds to this with larger 18 inch gray metallic alloy wheels, uh, privacy glass, a frameless rear view mirror, and if you specify an auto gearbox, paddle shift controls behind the steering wheel. Ideally though, you'd probably want to stretch to one of the two top spec variants, GT Sport, which as previously mentioned is what we have here, and GT Sport Tech. Now as well as all the features already mentioned, GT Sport spec gets you vinyl leather seat upholstery, which is heated up front, uh, plus a heated steering wheel, a powered driver's seat, and a 12 speaker Bose surround sound audio system. GT Sport Tech adds to that with a 360 degree monitor, front, rear and side camera setup and some extra camera driven safety features that we'll come on to in a minute. Now on to options. Uh, whatever variant you decide on, you'll almost certainly be paying your Mazda dealer extra for your choice of paint color because the only one that comes as standard is the only solid color, and that's Arctic White. Beyond that, there's a selection of pearlescent, metallic, and mica shades. We have Sonic Silver here. Uh, you'll need a little more to get the special polymetal gray metallic finish, which combines bright aluminum flakes and opaque pigment and offers tonality that changes with the light. Our favorite panel shade though is the top one. That's Mazda's specially developed signature Soul Red Metallic Paint, which features embedded tiny flakes of reflective pigment. It looks simply gorgeous. What else? Uh, well, you might want to further embellish the aesthetics of this car. Both the 16 and the 18 inch wheel rims can be ordered with a dark finish and you can upgrade to the larger 18 inch wheels if the trim grade you've chosen doesn't include them. Uh, you might want to add door mirror covers, roof mouldings and LED puddle light door illumination. Uh, for the cabin, you can add illuminated scuff plates, an alloy pedal set and luxury floor mats. If you've opted for one of the GT Sport grades, you can change the color of the vinyl leather upholstery to burgundy on the hatch version and to gray on the saloon. 
What about a few practical touches? Well, you can add mud flaps, a door entry protection foil, all weather floor mats, and for the boot, a rear bumper step foil and a trunk liner. You can add a roof rack, of course, as well as a roof box, ski and snowboard attachments, and a pro bicycle roof bar attachment. A tow bar is available, of course, and uh, to it, you can add a two bike bicycle carrier. Enough with extras, uh, we'll finish as usual with a look at safety provision. Now Mazda's keen for us to note just how much stronger the body is this time around thanks to its multi-directional ring structures and greater utilisation of ultra-high tensile steel. The result is double the level of energy absorption in an impact that the previous generation model could offer. Cabin deformation is minimised in a side impact by dispersing energy from multiple directions to the front and rear of the vehicle. Uh, the designers have also looked carefully at safety in the cabin and as a result, improvements to seat, airbag and seatbelt design have improved passive safety. For instance, the neck injury mitigating front seats have been further evolved to help reduce whiplash. Otherwise, it's pretty much as you'd expect. In addition to Isofix child seat fastenings and a pedestrian-friendly design for the front bonnet and the bumper, uh, there are the expected twin front side and curtain airbags, as well as a driver's knee bag this time around. Uh, there's also tyre pressure monitoring, hill start assist, and the usual electronic assistance for traction and stability control. Uh, the anti-lock brakes include a brake assist system for emergency stops, and those are advertised to following motorists by by automatically activating hazard flashing lights. In addition, there's speed limit sign assist, traffic sign recognition, which uh, pictures road signs as you pass and displays them on the dash, and a pedal misuse alert system, which alerts the driver when the accelerator and the brake pedals are depressed uh, simultaneously. These days though, buyers in this segment expect all that to be embellished by the kind of really sophisticated camera driven features that Mazda provides courtesy of its advanced eye active sense technology. Now with this fourth generation model, autonomous braking has been standardized across the range. Uh, now the brand calls its system SCBS or Smart City Brake Support. Uh, as with other such setups, this one scans the road ahead in search of potential collision hazards as you drive at speeds of up to 50 miles an hour with particular emphasis on identifying errant pedestrians. If a person or an object you might be imminently about to hit is detected, then you'll be warned. If you don't respond or, well, perhaps you aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Um, via a distance recognition support system, which is accessible through the center dash infotainment screen, you can vary the SCBS setup sensitivity via far, medium, or near settings. Um, overall, the Mazda SCBS approach to autonomous braking generally works well, although sometimes it is prone to flash up urgent brake warnings on the head-up display a bit more readily than it should. Uh, we like the way that the package is backed up by a secondary collision reduction feature, which keeps the anchors on in the event of an accident to stop the car hitting anything else. Uh, there's more too. In this Mark IV model, guys, all Mazda 3s get a further suite of clever features. Now, earlier we mentioned the Mazda radar cruise control system, which automatically keeps you a safe distance behind the car in front on the highway and on the auto models can, if necessary, even remotely slow you right down to a stop and then start you off again if you come across a tailback. Uh, there's also high beam control, which automatically dips your headlights for you at night. And earlier, we uh, also mentioned traffic sign recognition. Now that will picture uh, speed signs as you pass them and then display them for you on the dash. There's also lane keep assist that works at speeds of over 38 miles an hour to alert you if you drift out of lane on the highway before gently steering you back to where you should be. Advanced blind spot monitoring works at over 19 miles an hour to stop you from pulling out to overtake if there's a vehicle in your blind spot. And rear cross traffic alert uh, warns you of oncoming vehicles when you're reversing out of a space. Uh, there's also driver attention alert. Now that continually monitors your driving reactions for drought 
drowsiness. Uh, avoid the base SEL grades and you also get the LED headlights with adaptive functionality and a longer 200 meter range. Now here the headlamps distribute light from the high beams in three different patterns depending on the car's speed and they feature six stage directional control linked to the steering angle. Uh, if you want more safety kit, you'll have to stretch to the very top of the range. The top GT Sport Tech variant includes five further camera-driven features. Uh, there's front cross traffic alert, which alerts you to crossing traffic at junctions, and rear smart city brake support, which helps to prevent low-speed collisions when you're reversing. Um, there's a driver monitor. That's basically an even more sophisticated version of the driver attention alert setup that we just mentioned. And that uses uses a camera and infrared LED monitor to oversee the driver's condition both day and night, even if he or she happens to be wearing sunglasses. Uh, finally, there's Mazda's contribution to the current trend towards semi-autonomous driving, uh, CTS, or cruising traffic support. Uh, CTS automatically operates the accelerator and brake pedals to maintain a proper trailing distance between the car and the vehicle ahead. Uh, and that's great, not only at cruising speeds, but also when you're stuck in a traffic jam. Uh, in addition, it assists with uh, steering operations to keep you in lane, although you have to keep your hands on the wheel at all times. Originally, Mazda's Skyactive technology was mostly about saving weight. It still is, but other brands have now overtaken the Japanese maker in that regard, as the Hiroshima brand concentrates instead on more efficient underbonnet engineering. Turbocharging, the company says, isn't a good route to high efficiency, but mild hybrid tech is, hence the introduction of M-Hybrid light electrification on the base 2-litre Skyactiv G petrol unit we're trying here. This 24-volt mild hybrid system improves fuel economy by recycling recovered kinetic energy. A belt-driven integrated starter generator stores the energy recovered under deceleration in a 600 kilojoule lithium-ion battery, while a DC-DC converter supplies it to the car's electrical equipment features. Building further on this, the Skyactiv G power plant has reduced mechanical friction thanks to an upgraded piston skirt and an optimized oil ring profile. And there's a coolant control system for thermal management that promotes quick engine warm-up to reduce fuel consumption. More significantly, it also features cylinder deactivation, which shuts down cylinders one and four in light load situations, such as when you're cruising at a constant speed. The result of all that technological effort is a set of fuel economy and emissions figures uh, that are a lot better than you'd normally expect from a 2-litre petrol engine, up to 45.6 mpg on the combined cycle and up to 117 grams per kilometre of CO2. Unfortunately for Mazda though, those readings aren't particularly special by the standards achieved by comparable petrol engines producing around 120 PS in the family hatchback segment. But hold on, Mazda hasn't finished yet. What if a really clever engineering breakthrough could be added to this 2-litre power plant to not only take it ahead of the competition, but make it uh, even more cleaner and more frugal than any equivalent diesel? While well, every brand in this sector would like to be able to offer such a thing, uh, Mazda claims it can though, courtesy of the groundbreaking SPCCI, Spark Controlled Compressed Ignition System that's used in its top Skyactiv X petrol engine. SPCCI technology comes out of Mazda's belief, shared in many circles, that electric powertrains actually don't satisfy society's current wish for a drastic reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, take electricity production into account and your average electric car doesn't actually deliver zero emissions at all. Two thirds of global electricity production is generated through the use of fossil fuels for goodness sake. As a result, your average electric vehicle's wheel-to-well CO2 reading, that's the figure that takes everything into account, can often be very close to that of a conventional petrol or diesel fuel model, uh, depending on the energy mix that the electricity is made from. Now, Mazda hasn't uh, abandoned EV development as a result, but it has decided to buck the current technological trend and put significant investment into seeing just how much more efficient a conventional petrol engine can be. A lot more efficient as it turns out. 
The Skyactiv X engine is based on the 2 litre normally aspirated mild hybrid Skyactiv G unit, but it can run far leaner than any ordinary petrol power plant ever could, improving efficiency by up to 30% over the Skyactiv G. And that's helped by a supercharger, which ensures that there's enough air for the clever spark controlled compression ignition system to function. Uh, the result is a set of fuel and CO2 readings that should better those of the alternative conventional. 1.8 litre turbocharged Skyactiv D diesel in regular use. For reference, a Mazda 3 Skyactiv D model manages up to 56.5 mpg on the WLTP combined cycle and up to 107 grams per kilometre of any DC rated CO2. But why would you choose it over the more potent, quieter, cheaper to fuel, and comparably priced Mazda 3 Skyactiv X petrol model? Well, answers on a postcard, please. Of course, sophisticated engineering's all very well, but the main contributing factor to ultimate running cost returns is the way that you drive. Now, to help you focus on that, Mazda provides a fuel efficiency monitor in the information section of the Mazda Multimedia System Center Dash screen, which gives you an energy flow monitor, which shows the real-time operation of the M hybrid system and the current status of the cylinder deactivation and the I-Stop engine stop start system. Uh, keep an eye on all that and you can really make the most of the fact that in our experience official fuel and CO2 figures of Mazda cars tend to be closer to actual reality than most other brands. On to the other things you'll need to consider when it comes to running cost returns. Uh, your Mazda 3 will require a service every 12 months or every 12,500 miles, whichever comes around sooner. Uh, you'll be offered the option of a fixed price maintenance plan which covers all scheduled servicing with parts and labor for three years or 37,500 miles. Uh, owners can keep up to date with their car's maintenance schedule via the vehicle status section of that Mazda multimedia system system screen or via a useful My Mazda app which can give you reminders about servicing and through which you can book your car in at your local dealership and access a digitally stored record of your model service history. What else? Residual values. Well, this Mazda does reasonably well here. Independent experts reckon that a Mazda 3 Skyactiv G hatch uh, with base SEL trim will still be worth £8,950 after three years or 60,000 miles of use, which is very class competitive. As a result, leasing costs for this car are also pretty competitive, even when compared with some cars in this segment that feature a lower sticker price. Uh, we should additionally mention the warranty, that's the usual unremarkable three-year 60,000 mile package. If you want to extend it, you can do that via an optional essential, elite or complete plan. Uh, included in the standard package is a three-year paintwork warranty and 12 years of anti-perforation cover. In addition, uh, there's a Mazda accident aftercare scheme which sees the company liaise with your insurer after an accident, making sure that you have access to a courtesy car if you need one and ensuring that all repairs are carried out to full Mazda standards. VED taxation is still based on CO2 figures collated under the old NEDC test, which means that based on the readings we've quoted earlier, uh, you can expect to pay £145 in the first year of ownership for the Skyactiv D diesel and £165 for this Skyactiv G petrol model. And finally, we'll tell you about insurance. Uh, if you opt for the Skyactiv G petrol SEL model, you'll pay a premium based on Group 15E rating. It's 16E for Sport Lux or 17E if you go for one of the GT Sport models. For the Skyactiv D diesel, it'll be Group 15E unless you've opted for one of the GT Sport models, in which case it'll be Group 17E. What it all boils down to is that, to some extent at least, this is a car that you can buy with your head as well as your heart. Like Volvo, Mazda has thrived since being released from the shackles of Ford ownership 
to the point where the brand has almost pulled off the perfect package here. Golf like quality, focused driving dynamics, and an almost Italian sense of style. Now, we found it very difficult to fault this car in the first two of those areas, and its efforts to stand out are laudable, but they do severely compromise back seat space and rear passenger visibility, too, and to some extent, boot capacity. If you can live with those few caveats, we have very little doubt that you'd live very happily with this Mazda 3. Uh, steering feel and handling match the finest in the segment, while manual gearbox response betters it, taking this car to the point where we'd pronounce it to be the best all-round choice in its class when it comes to driving dynamics. Yes, even better than a Focus, it's that good. We've been equally impressed by the sophisticated interior, which for us sets a fresh class benchmark, well, for the time being anyway. And even on base models, there are premium features, uh, a head-up display, for example, that you simply wouldn't expect to find as standard across the range in a car of this class. The Skyactiv engine technology is a lot more of a mixed bag. Uh, this test car's Skyactiv G petrol unit isn't particularly noteworthy in terms of either performance or efficiency. And we can't really see why anyone would choose the alternative Skyactiv D diesel when much the same money buys Mazda's innovative Skyactiv X spark controlled compressed ignition supercharged petrol unit that delivers similar efficiency, uh, runs on cheaper fuel, and offers greater refinement and more power. If you can stretch to Skyactiv X power, you'll apply the finishing touch to a very complete family hatchback indeed. There are some times when looking beyond convention pays great dividends, and we'd suggest that this might well be one of them.